Hi there. I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more of our virtual conversations. The great writer Thomas Mann, writing about a century ago, said that in our time, the destiny of man presents its meanings in political terms. Today, he might have said in legal terms, we see three cops indicted for aiding and abetting a murder on a public street in Minneapolis. The Attorney General of the United States scuppering a criminal prosecution of Michael Flynn, who two times pleaded guilty to lying to the FBI. The President invoking the Insurrection Act, threatening to send the United States Army into the states to put down lawful protest demonstrations. And finally, the Supreme Court wrestling with the issue as to whether a subpoena is a lawful command to produce documents or simply a worthless piece of paper when served on the President of the United States for his tax returns. With us to help sort all this out is Dahlia Lithwick. Dahlia Lithwick is one of the foremost legal analysts in the United States. She is a contributor to Newsweek, a senior editor of Slate, and we're very much pleased to have her join the program. Well, Dahlia, it looks like a pretty strong case against uh, Chauvin, the cop who had his knee on uh, George Floyd's neck. But uh, what about the other three cops? They appear to have done nothing more than stand by. One looks as though he was standing guard with his back to uh, uh, what was going on. Uh, is that enough to make out a case of aiding and abetting? First, Jim, thank you so much for having me. It's, um, it's such a pleasure to be here. And I should note that probably not a week goes by when I don't mention your book as the sort of paradigmatic how to think about Trump and immunity. And I guess immunity is one of the themes of, of this conversation. Look, I think that the evidence is devastating. And one of the things that is so striking is the quantum of video. I mean, this is not one or two people recording. They've amassed more and more and more video, none of which seems to exculpate the cops. I mean, the, the, there were people who were telling the police, get off him, he can't breathe. I mean, there was a clear consensus in the crowd that this had gone overboard. And I think all of that, just in the aggregate, is so damning, not just uh, uh, for Chauvin, but for the other three. Um, the only reason I'm loath to make any legal conclusion is let's not forget, we had a mass of this kind of evidence in Eric Garner's case. Uh, this is not the first time that citizen journalists have recorded what looks to you, I mean, you said it, I'll say it, just like a flat out murder that was absolutely unnecessary using a hold that was not permissible. And yet you can have 40, 50, 60 accounts and somehow it doesn't seem to stick. And so I don't think the question is an evidentiary question. I think it's a larger question about police and immunity and why it is that no matter how many videos you have of the same scene, the cops seem to skate almost every time. Well, um, I seem to remember from law school, there was a doctrine that the law doesn't require anyone to be a good Samaritan. And uh, clearly there's no criminal responsibility or other responsibility imposed on the uh, standers by and the, the lookers on who did no more than the cops. They just stood there and, and watched. Uh, so why don't we indict them and why do we indict the three cops uh, for aiding and abetting? Well, for one thing, I think that some of the, the bystanders were imploring uh, uh, the cops to intervene. They were doing exactly what you would have them do. You're right, there's no duty to rescue, but I think that they were calling out what they were seeing, which is more than any of the three cops were doing. But obviously the cops are in a very, very different role, right? Their job is to be keepers of the peace. Their job is to impose control on this situation. And maybe the real answer to your question, Jim, is that part of the problem we have with policing in this country is there's such a disparity, if you include also the racial and power disparity between what the police can get away with and what a citizen can get away 
away with. My God, if I had been a person of color in that crowd, I would not have been lunging at those officers trying to stop them. And I think maybe that goes to the heart of the problem. There's such a symmetry here in power that to ask bystanders to intercede in what looks like a murder in plain view is to ask them to risk their own lives. And we certainly don't have that kind of doctrine of duty to rescue. Well, potentially it could be a criminal offense to interfere with a lawful arrest. So uh, the citizens were well advised uh, not to charge uh, Chauvin and uh, push him off uh, Garner's neck um, because uh, they may have themselves been committing a crime. But the cops, I guess, uh, have a duty uh, to uh, uh, interdict a felony that's being committed in their presence. And uh, they would have breached that duty if they saw exactly what was going on, although one had his back to uh, uh, what was happening. Uh, so it's a difficult question. Also, I think under Minnesota law, there's a requirement uh, that there has to be some uh, knowledge on the part of the aider and abetter that something illegal is going to happen, a foreknowledge. Uh, and uh, it's just not enough to uh, uh, be present at the commission of a crime, even if uh, you uh, mentally uh, are happy that the crime is going on. I don't know whether that element is made out here. So uh, um, it's gonna be a, a fascinating case that unfolds involving the three other officers. I, I think maybe I would just add this. Throughout the, the now two weeks that we've seen nationwide protests, Jim, about police excessive use of force and racialized policing and the notion that the police are immune uh, no matter what they do and how much force they use. It's been really interesting to see the split within police departments. And in, in some ways, it's embodied by these officers who are willing to take a knee at protests and the officers who emphatically disagree with the idea of protest. Uh, I'm thinking of the cops in Buffalo uh, who threw a protester uh, to the ground and, and the well, folks one who- cop, One cop did and the others uh, resigned from, um, uh, it was in a squad as I understand it, resigned from the police department. 57 yeah. uh, cops resigned uh, uh, in solidarity. And I think one of the interesting things that we're seeing right now, and it's kind of hard to wrap your head around it in real time, is that the police themselves are really getting dragged into this reckoning of you know what is excessive force, what is presumptively my role as a bystander when I see something going on, and to me you know amid all these really hard systemic like are we going to defund the entire police, which is you know now become uh, uh, the cry here. I think one of the really interesting things that we're not really understanding is how this is playing out within police forces. And it really seems to differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, uh, whether police officers kind of have come to view themselves as warrior warriors in a lawless land, or they think they're complicit in something that's gone on for centuries and they have to sort of lead the way out. But it seems to me that some of the questions you're asking about what happened to George Floyd really, I think, crack open that seam of where police officers think of themselves in these, you know, time, time, time again, instances of, you know, excessive force and racial policing. Well, we've seen demonstrations, not only uh, massive demonstrations, not only throughout the country, but also throughout the world in foreign cities, in uh, Paris and in London and uh, in the Far East. And um, uh, you wonder what kind of uh, uh, spectacle this creates of what we're all about in America. But it's, I would think, uh, all well and good to say Black Lives Matter and to protest and to uh, stand with uh, stand with our fellow citizens who don't want to be brutalized and we don't want to see them brutalized. But what does this mean as a practical matter in terms of police reform? What do you think is needed? It is such a hard question, and I'm trying to wrap myself around what it even means, this not cry to defund entire police departments. You know, there's a, a great piece in the Washington Post 
uh, this morning trying to explain it. I, I will say this, I had on my podcast this week, which you, you joined me um, when your book came out, I had Vanita Gupta, who was the head of the Civil Rights Division at the Justice Department under um, Barack Obama. And she really made a kind of clarion call, Jim, to think very deeply about how over we invested we are in policing. Uh, that it's not just when she was at DOJ, she thought, you know, you get some de consent decrees and you do a few pattern and practice investigations, none of which, by the way, happens in the Jeff Sessions and Bill Barr Justice Department. But I think her feeling was this is fundamentally so beyond even systemic police reform. Her argument is this is a real moment to think about how we invest in our communities, how we invest in education, what we're doing about housing. And for her, it's not tinkering around the margins of policing. It's a fundamental reshaping of our priorities. And for me, hearing that coming from her uh, and the vantage she's had has really forced me to think very deeply about maybe just tinkering about, you know, what kind of chokeholds are permissible and what kind are not uh, is just, just the tip of the iceberg. They're um, impermissible in virtually every police department in the country. But uh, even if you were to go uh, state by state and city by city and um, uh, tighten the regulations and the rules, it probably wouldn't do a great deal. Uh, but do you support defunding our police uh, as, a, as a way of uh, police, as a measure of police reform? My, my current thinking on this is that it's not clear to me what within the entire spectrum of what we're calling defund the police we're actually talking about. And I think in some ways we've got a, a movement now that is afoot that has, by the way, a week ago defund the police seemed, you know, off anybody's menu and suddenly it's at front and center of what we're hearing uh, called for. I think I would be, this is going to sound lawyerly and like a cop out, but I would want to be really clear what that means and what people are asking for, because I think right now it's a catchphrase that sweeps in a huge, huge range of, you know, possible outcomes. And I'm not sure we're talking about it with any crispness right now. Um, I do think uh, the other thing we should talk about just in conjunction with this is the militarization of the police, what happened last week in Lafayette Square, you know, the possibility that Bill Barr had Bureau of Prisons officers and other officers whose insignias were covered, who were doing the work of, of uh, quelling peaceful protest. I think one of the things that's gotten very confused in this conversation is what is the police anymore? And when we're calling out uh, uh, the National Guard, when we're um, conscripting Bureau of Prisons officers uh, to put down civilian uh, protests, I think part of what got very, very confused and what led to what you're describing, this suddenly we're crying for defunding the entire police department, is a huge huge, huge panic about who the police is right now. Uh, well, uh, you have even more than that because the president invoked the Insurrection Act and uh, said he might send the army to states where it was needed to, as you put it, quell uh, the protests, which were lawful uh, protests protected by the Constitution. Uh, so, I mean, what kind of uh, country are we living in? To me, Jim, I think the signal moment last week, the, the overreach on the part of the president was just that. I'm not sure he invoked it. I think he was saying he was thinking about invoking it to get around posse comitatus problems. I know his spokesperson Posse said, comitatus means that uh, we don't use the army for domestic uh, law enforcement purposes quite he, broadly. Exactly. Said. And the Insurrection Act is a way of getting around that. The president can get around it, although my understanding is it's almost always invoked when the governor of a state asks the president to send in the military, not that the president on his own uh, can send it in. But, but I guess I would just say, to me, I think the, the singular most important moment last week when that conversation started was when Mark Esper pushed back 
was when we saw prominent military leaders pushing back, Colin Powell pushing back yesterday. I think that that may have been the fracturing that we've been waiting for. When the military itself read, you know, that Tom Cotton op-ed in the New York Times about putting down, you know, putting send, down by Send force. in the troops, he said. Send in the troops was the headline. Send in the troops, and he was tweeting about no quarter, which I understand to be kind of a war crime, the way he was invoking it. I think that what the president did was send a message to the military that he would want them to follow unconstitutional orders. What I saw was a huge proportion of the military stop short, Jim, and say, whatever is going to happen, that I will not do. And to me, almost as much as, you know, the shock of seeing what happened in Lafayette Square last week, the shock that the military, the military has a line that it seems to be drawing now, that actually surprised and heartened me a little bit. Except what do you make of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Miley, uh, standing next to the president in front of the church? In, in dress uniform, I mean, I think that there's there's real concern, and I think it's too soon to know what, not just the, the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, but also Bill Barr participating in that. And there's some question about whether Bill Barr gave the order, right? This is, this is uh, the Attorney General of the United States who somehow maybe gave the order to clear that park and who went on television on Sunday and said, there's no chemical in pe pepper spray. You know, there's no chemical compound in that. I think what you're describing and what is, is chilling is that there seems to be some part of the military and the Justice Department who's perfectly willing <laughs> to quell peaceful protest. Um, the one other thing that I've been thinking about, and you probably know this better than me, is the extent to which freedom of assembly in this country, we don't talk that much about the peaceable assembly part of the First Amendment, but how profoundly we've given that right away that all these time, place, and manner restrictions, all these restrictions on who can protest and where you can protest, the fact that the White House has pushed the perimeter out farther and farther. That's one of those examples of, Justice Scalia used to always talk about, if you don't exercise your rights, you're giving them away. I think we have not thought carefully enough about the right to protest in this country. And until about a hundred years ago, you didn't have to get a permit to protest. You didn't have to follow all sorts of time, place, and manner restrictions. That's something that cities kind of encroached upon the right to peaceable assembly. And now I think we've flipped it where we're at the mercy of whoever is permitting that Lafayette Square you know, protest for them to decide when it's inappropriate. And I just think maybe this is a moment for Americans to think about a more robust right to assemble under the First Amendment. But of course, the conservative Supreme Court has repeatedly, uh, they've really evolved these standards of time, place, and manner, and uh, uh, what kinds of uh, restraints can be made on both speech and assembly. Uh, and uh, I remember when uh, there was some kind of a demonstration in New York City when Giuliani was the mayor, uh, years ago, he said, well, they can demonstrate uh, somewhere in Yankee Stadium uh, if they stay uh, in the infield. I mean, what do you make of an attorney general uh, throttling a prosecution of a defendant who's not once but twice pleaded guilty? To a not crime? just that. It's an extraordinary thing. Sullivan, Judge Emmett Sullivan is now actually having to file in the DC Circuit Court of Appeals on his own behalf, sort of asserting his own jurisdiction to manage a case that he's been managing. It's such an unprecedented uh, act of war for the Justice Department to not only say, we're dropping this prosecution, but also uh, that the judge has no jurisdiction to even question uh, what it is that happened at the Justice Department, having secured over two years, having secured these guilty pleas. And as the judge says in his, in his uh, uh, court papers, he says, he 
pleaded guilty. He said he did so without reservation or coercion. And you're taking that um, out of the hands of the courts. And I think it's another one of those chilling moments where you see that the Justice Department, there's no way to look at this other than kneecapping the federal courts. This is not, I, you know, I, I put this with a whole line of, of, of moments in which they say there's no place in the courts uh, for anything. Uh, the courts are, are subordinate entirely to DOJ. I, I find this shocking. Um, the Constitution uh, says the president has the executive power. And, um, you know, we don't like uh, Trump. He is the, the human being who happens to be the president. But uh, I think Barr's position is, well, as long as he is the president, uh, he controls uh, public prosecutions and uh, can do what he wants to do. I mean, I think that that's a tough, tough row to hoe when you have both the Nixon precedent and the Clinton precedent suggesting otherwise. But they made a sure made a heck of a case before the Supreme Court. And we'll see what the court does. I guess it's useful to flag for the purposes of folks who are tuning in that there are different arguments that were made in the New York grand jury case and the congressional subpoena case. And I think I don't know if you agree. I think that the New York case was tougher sledding for Trump's lawyers, but I think There's no that, question about know, it. Yeah, but I think these are these are not just cases about getting a hold of Trump's tax returns and other financial records. These are cases about presidential immunity, and you know it's 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 hard to forget that in one of these cases, Trump's lawyers said the president could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and not be investigated. I mean, this is- he, he said that in the Second Circuit. So if he shot someone on Fifth Avenue, clearly an unofficial act, uh, the, uh, uh, could not the police investigate? Could not the, the district attorney investigate? Couldn't they interview witnesses before they disappeared? Uh, couldn't they uh, see what happened and find the gun and all the rest of it? Uh, but, uh, which is what they always do. But the basic principle goes back to merry old England, and that is the public is entitled to every man's evidence. And uh, are going to exclude the president? If you exclude the president from it, then he's clearly above the law, even for non-official conduct, and even for conduct which occurred before he was president. Now, in the Clinton case, uh, uh, clearly there was uh, conduct before he was president, and uh, the court said it could be the subject of a civil suit. And in fact, uh, the deposition where he committed perjury had led to uh, uh, his impeachment. And, and if you listen to the oral arguments in, in both of those cases before the Supreme Court, the feeling that Congress is not a legitimate legislative body, that it is an entity that is another, quote, enemy of the people, it exists only to harass and demean and embarrass the president. And what was, again, a little bit worrisome to me was the degree to which that kind of analysis had real traction with some of the justices. Uh, there was a feeling, and I think Sam Alito voiced it really loud and clear, that even in the New York case, that you know prosecutors in New York are in cahoots with Congress just trying to shame the president and the entire thing is an Ill illegitimate witch hunt. I mean, that is so anathema, not just to what you're saying about, you know, the president ultimately is a man and subject to the the rule of law, but also anathema to just basic checks and balances, basic ideas about co-equal branches checking each other. And I was really distressed in that argument to hear how salient it is for some of the justices to just hear claims that nothing Congress does is legitimate. There's no legitimate uh, legislative intent here. They're just doing it to harass the president. That, that shouldn't garner four votes, but it may. It's all political. Well, Breyer suggested that the judges are very bad at uh, making uh, political decisions. But Alito said, suggested that in violation of grand jury secrecy, uh, Vance, if he got the returns, would turn them over to the New York Times. I mean, it, um, it, just an amazing uh, train of thought uh, coming from a justice of the Supreme Court. So anyway, we've unfortunately run out of time because this has been absolutely marvelous. Uh, but I have a question for you, Dahlia Lithwick. And my question is, 
uh, does our destiny present its meaning uh, in legal terms these days? It's a great question. And the minute you said it, I thought he's going to ask what I think about that. I better formulate an opinion. I, you know, I think that in this country, uh, I've always said that the law and the rule of law is our secular church. And I do think that it's not an accident that the framers were mostly lawyers. It's not an accident uh, that the Declaration of Independence and uh, the Bill of Rights are, are legal documents. I think that this country was born uh, of a moment in which legal meaning is political meaning. Uh, they're the same and that the Supreme Court, you know, built like a temple, the justices shuffle around in black robes looking like oracles. I think that we derive tremendous meaning from uh, the Constitution and the law. Well, we recognize that the law has its limitations, but we've come to the end. So I have to thank you, Dahlia Lithwick, for coming by and thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more of our conversations, which I'm afraid are going to be virtual. But one day we will be back in our studio. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care, be well, be safe, and all the best.